Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is video 13 from the Beginner to Chess Master playlist, which is a progressive series of videos. And I'd like to discuss with you a very important topic, uh, share with you a very important term in chess, and that is a uh, hole. A hole in a chess game or a hole in a chess position is uh, determined by observing the pawns and the pawns alone, assessing the pawn structure. So with that said, let me make a quick adjustment to the board here. And for right now at least, let's just give some special attention to the pawns, the little guys, the most important aspect of a chess game. In every chess game, there will likely be holes that white creates and black creates. A hole for white is a square that can no longer be controlled by any white pawns. Similarly, a hole for black is a square that can no longer be controlled by any black pawns. Let me say right off the bat that holes in a chess position are a weakness. They are a deficiency. They are... Let's just say a, a hole in the white position is a window of opportunity for black to capitalize on in some way. We'll see examples of how this uh, how this can come about. Um, they are a weakness. Uh, this topic, by the way, is one that is focused on a pos this is a positional aspect to chess a strategic uh, type of thing with the game uh, assessing pawn structures identifying weaknesses holes within one's position and how how exactly to formulate a plan around this and take advantage of these gaps in your opponent's position these are this is something that a positional strategic player, those two terms, positional and strategic, are quite often used interchangeably. This is something that the posi positional player, strategic player, is exceptional at. They identify these things very well. They know how to take advantage of these holes, these weaknesses within a pawn structure. One of the greatest strategic minds the game has ever seen, arguably the most strategic player, former world champion, many-time world champion, world champion from 1975 to 1985, Anatoly Karpov. He was once quoted as saying, Pawns not only create the sketch for the whole painting, they are also the soil, the foundation of any position. Uh, if you're familiar with golf, golf and chess are similar in that in golf, you read the greens. You know, when it comes, when you're ready to make a putt, you read the greens first. You assess the greens, let's just say. And from that little assessment, that helps you to do what? It helps you know in what direction you should strike the ball and at what speed. Similarly, in chess, we assess the pawn structure, and from our assessment, determining the weaknesses, the gaps within a structure, how the pawns are positioned, the chains that are created. This gives us some instructions of how we should position our, posi our pieces, where we should position our pieces, or where we ought to, where we ought to position our pieces. They will provide very useful information to us assessing the pawn structure, just like assessing the greens uh, is helpful to uh, the player who's ready to putt. Um, the pawns are the instruction manual for the rest of your pieces. Uh, we're going to have a look at several examples here, but before I dive into that, let's look at a very specific example. Let's see a specific example of a hole in a chess game. When the game begins, we, of course, know that all white pawns begin on the second rank. They occupy all second rank squares. 
They do not control the second rank squares. The big difference. They occupy the second rank squares but not control. They do control all third rank squares, however. They are directly controlling all third rank squares, at least once. All of these squares are under white's control by the pawns. Additionally, all fourth rank squares have the potential to be controlled. The A pawn, for example, can move forward a single step and B4 is all of a sudden controlled. The B pawn can also step forward one step and then both A4 and C4 will be under white's control. And if we move, continue to move in this direction from the A file to the C file, sure enough we'll see that all the other highlighted squares I have up here are not holes. They are under white's control or have the potential to be under white's control by the white pawns. We can continue in this manner. We can look at the 5th rank, 6th rank, and continue on up the board. At some point or another, all of these squares can be controlled by the white pawns. Great. There are no gaps when we begin a chess game. No holes when we begin a chess game. Let's look at how some of them can be created as we make pawn moves. Let's say that white begins with the move h3. Have any holes been created with that one move? The answer, if you'd like to pause the video and figure it out, feel free to do that. I'm going to go right into it. No, no holes have been created. This one square was under white's control, but after the pawn moves, okay. It, it isn't controlling g3, but we still have this pawn around that's controlling g3. So no holes have been created. When a rook pawn moves one square, one square has been weakened. When a rook pawn moves two squares, two squares have been weakened. It's no long, it no longer has the potential to go to h3 and control g4. Okay. Rook pawns, they move a single step, one square is weakened. Two steps, two squares are weakened. All of the other pawns, it's double trouble. What do I mean by that? If the b pawn goes one step, two squares are now weakened c3 and a3. In fact, a3 of the two highlighted squares, a3 we can already identify as a hole. No white pawns can control that square from this point on. c3, on the other hand, is under white's control, so no, no issue there. If the b pawn goes two squares, well, now four squares have been weakened. a3, c3, a4, c4. Just trying to give you a little bit of a visual here to help identify uh, any weaknesses when your opponent makes a pawn move. What you can do is look at the adjacent files. Look at if the B pawn goes two steps, look at the A file. Draw a line up like so. Look at the C file. You can visually draw uh, a line up like so. These squares here are the ones that are weakened. Are any of them now holes? Yes. Not c3 and not c4, but sure enough, we do have both a3 and a4 as squares we can already identify on the white side as holes. Something black may very well be able to take advantage of at some point. We need to be careful of the weaknesses we create with uh, our pawn movements. We need to be very delicate when we move our pawns. They just by, their, just by their definition, they can only move forward. They can never run in reverse and repair those weaknesses. There will be positives and negatives connected with every pawn move we make. And I know I'm drawing attention to these weaknesses that they're, uh, they create when you make pawn moves. And you might be going in the direction you might be thinking to yourself already, well, you know what, okay... Holes, uh, you know, they're weaknesses, therefore, you know, I'm just, I'm never going to create any holes in my position. Well, that's not a good approach. Do know that in order to gain something in a chess game, you have to give something up. Um, you will be creating weaknesses. It's okay to do that, but you need to at least be careful about watching uh, how you can remedy these weaknesses you are leaving behind. Okay? Uh, we're going to have a look at some examples of this in action, and I believe 
we can, I think that's everything I wanted to say before I went into the first example. Yeah, I think we're ready to go and have a look at our first of several examples. This one here being our first. With any pawn move, we're going to question any holes created? No. With this one here, we look at the adjacent files. These four have been weakened. No holes, though. They're watched over. The G pawn can control this guy. And uh, the C pawn can control that guy right there. So no holes so far. C5, no holes. Knight F3, D6, another pawn move. So these two squares, are they holes? Nope. Okay, d4. Uh, let's consider these here. One, two, three, four. None of them are holes. We have the b pawn that can watch over uh, the c file squares, and the f pawn can watch over uh, the e file squares still. So no, no gaps, no holes for white, no holes for black thus far. Knight f6, knight c3, a6. Another pawn move. This is our first hole. B6. This is now a square that can no longer be controlled by any black pawns. Okay. But, as mentioned, uh, you have to give... You know, there's a little... There's a positive and negative connected with these moves. So, it's serving a useful role to watch over a knight from one day, maybe jumping here. Um, and maybe even it's it's looking to expand like this. Positive and negative connected. Useful rule. Watch over b5, but do know it's something to keep an eye on as white. The b6 square. Maybe somehow we can take advantage of that at some point. Let's continue. Bishop out. e5. Okay, another pawn move. Let's consider the squares it weakens. These four are weakened. Um, are any of them now holes? f6 is guarded, f5 has the potential to be guarded, but we actually now do have a hole, in fact, two. d6 and d5 are now considered holes for black, squares that can no longer be controlled by any black pawns. Why would black want to do something like this, weaken their position? Well, there's something gained. e5 establishes a strong pawn in the center. Uh, combats white's e4 pawn, chases a strongly placed white knight away, is to find a new home, knight b3. Black now follows up with bishop to e6. So this is the point that I really wanted to draw your attention to with this example. And that is, when you create holes in your position, you, you will do well to watch over those squares with uh, specific pieces, um, well, let's just say the minor pieces do really well to remedy the weaknesses you create. So right now, this d5 square is a hole in black's position. And the bishop is now deploying to a square where it at least watches over this d5 square. Um, should, at some point, white occupy the square with a knight or some other piece, black always has the option to eliminate that piece. Do know that when you create a weakness in your position, if your opponent is able to position one of their pieces in in the hole in your position, like a knight right here on this square, if this knight is able to stay here, he can be extremely disruptive to the entire black position. Quite often, when you have your opponent position one of their pieces in your position. You will do very well to take care of it. Uh, almost like right away. You really you don't want to have to work around that piece. It's, it's, it's very, it can be very, very disruptive. Um, so by positioning the bishop on e6, in other words, um, should the knight play here, you have the option of at least capturing it. Uh, you could play knight takes knight, or even bishop takes knight, and if the pawn is having to recapture, well, this hole is not as much of a 
uh, an issue anymore for black. If it's if a hole is being plugged up here with, let's say, uh, this this white pawn now on d5, it's it's now no longer a square that can be occupied by a white piece. Something that would be much more disruptive to black than a white pawn on the d5 square. So my point here: a weakness has been created on d5. How is this giving us some instruction? Uh, this this structure here of e5 and d6. Why is the bishop playing the e6 of all squares? Well, it's watching over a weak square on d5, and the bishop um, gets my vote for being of the minor pieces, of the knights and the bishops. The bishop gets my vote for being the most efficient defender, or the more efficient defender of the knight and bishop, when it comes time to secure uh, a weak square. The d5 square is weakened. The bishop does really well. It sits well. It, it, not only, it not only watches over this square, but does some other things. It still um, has some other influence in the game. It's not just specific to watching the single square. Additionally, uh, if it does happen at some point where... Let's say the knight is no longer available to stay on the f6 square. Let's say somehow this pawn gets all the way up here and the knight has to now find a new home. Well, when the knight moves, it's immediately no longer going to control that weak square d5. The bishop, on the other hand, uh, there's if you could envision that, let's say, there's not a pawn on f6. If somehow or another, or some way or another, the bishop is, let's say, attacked. It has the option, in some cases, where it can get out of the way from danger and still fulfill that same useful role of, let's say, watching over the d5 square. In this, in this, in this case here, of course, he cannot do that. But I'm just trying to express a difference between a bishop and a knight when it comes time to secure. Uh, a, a weak square, a hole within one's position. The bishop, I believe, is the more efficient of the two. Okay, let's get another move in. White castles, knight goes here, and this is as far as I wanted to take this one. Um, this example, I wanted to show uh, a couple instances of holes within one's position. There are three holes for black, none for white, and what has black done? Well, they've at least positioned their pieces in a way where they are watching over these weak squares. So that in the event white somehow tries to occupy this this weak square, black is there to at least get rid of it with a piece, the bishop or the knight. Additionally, this knight, he is actually indirectly influencing the d5 square himself. It's not just the knight on f6 and the bishop on d5 that are watching over d5. But the knight on d7 indirectly has a say about the d5 square. Because one day white might want to do something like bishop g5 saying, aha, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get rid of one of your defenders of d5, and then I'll be that much closer to one day. Putting a piece in your position and then maintaining a piece there. Well, black, notice with the knight playing here, if the knight is ever captured, guess who's recapturing? This guy right here. And he's back to securing the d5 square. This is a very popular position. It has a name, but I'm not going to share it with you. I, w I don't want you to be focused on the name that's not important. What's important here is what the pieces are doing. Identifying the weaknesses, knowing what just this one weakness is, can already give you some insight as to where your other pieces uh, uh, will stand well. Um, those, those of you watching this who uh, are already familiar with this topic of holes and such, maybe, maybe you were familiar with this type of setup and you weren't exactly sure of why the pieces are placed how they are. And, well, maybe this was a little bit helpful to you as a result. Looking at, uh, the weakness on d5, this gives our pieces some direction. The bishop on e6 the knight here to reinforce a knight on f6 who's controlling that weak square d5. Okay, let's have a look at another example, another 
another setup here. Any weaknesses? No. Weaknesses? No. Any, excuse me, any holes for either side? No. Consider these squares for white. No holes so far. These squares for black. No holes. Night out, night out. G3. Aha. Our first hole, and it is H3. Can no longer be controlled by any white pawns. Okay. G6. There's two holes that are now created. F6 and H6 are no longer, can no longer be controlled by any black pawns. Okay. Both players are preparing to develop their bishop. This has a certain term I have yet to share in the series. When you move your knight pawn up, like so, and then position your bishop in that pawn's place, it is said that your bishop has been fienkettoed. Call this a fienkettoed bishop. Fienkettoed bishop for black. Uh, and all that means is you are positioning your bishop in a way where it then operates along the corner-to-corner -corner diagonal, the longest diagonal of the chessboard, a fienkettoed bishop. Okay, so already we can identify some holes. That's well and good, but let's take it a step further. These holes for each side, um, they give us a bit of an idea of what pieces of ours are now very important to us. We have, as, as black, there are these squares that are weakened. The bishop on g7, he is now an extremely important piece to hang on to. The, for white, the bishop on g2, he's extremely important for white to hang on to. Now, why is this the case? Well, if he's not around, the bishop on g2 is not around, or the bishop on g7 is not around, white's king might be vulnerable if this guy is not around. Black's king might be vulnerable if this bishop is not around. It's quite likely in chess that you will castle kingside. It's much easier to accomplish. You only need to move out of the way a couple minor pieces of knight and bishop, and you're ready to go. Kingside castling is quite uh quite popular and who's going to be a really good uh defender of your king side who's a very important defender of your king side who's a very important defender of the weaknesses that you have created on your king side the bishop without this bishop around one day your opponent may be able to operate on the h3 square and position a piece there and it could be quite uncomfortable the identifying these weaknesses are already giving us some insight um, about our other pieces. Uh, going with a, a fianchetto like this, these uh, a kingside fianchetto, these bishops are extremely important. They, they have a great influence uh, on the center of the board. They, they stretch along that main diagonal, and they're also now very important to hang on to. Without them around, your king can be vulnerable. The, the squares near your king can potentially be exploited. Okay, let's get a couple more moves in. D3, any holes created? These are the squares that are weakened, but no. No holes created after D3. No new holes. D6, no new holes with that move. E4, any new holes? You bet. Let's consider... Looking at the adjacent files like this, after the move e4, four squares have been weakened. Any holes created? Yes. Three. Not f4, that's carded, but these three right here are now holes in white's position. Squares that can no longer be controlled by any white pawns. Uh, when you have a hole in your position, it's uh, your opponent will do well to position one of their pawns in a way where it controls uh, that square. A knight will have support now when he does jump into the d4 square. That's a nice, nice little setup to shoot for. 
So some holes have been created with this last move, e4, but it does establish a pawn in the center. Black connects his knights, he develops, and now we have the move knight to e2, and notice a move that we do not see here by white, and that is the move knight to f3. Uh, there's a reason for this, and this is, this is the main point I wanted want to highlight in this one. Uh, if the knight is playing to f3, notice that this gives black an opportunity to eliminate a piece who is controlling a now very important square, d4. The knight is in a pin. If the bishop is challenged, the bishop can exchange himself for the knight, and now black can now devise a plan uh, about the, the d4 square. He can train his pieces in a way where they will be maintained on the d4 square, and he can be a very, he will be, a very disruptive piece to the white position. I'm just showing you with these two examples how, yes, you can create weaknesses, but take care of them. Position your pieces in a way, your minor pieces, in a way where they give, provide some security to these gaps within your position. Positioning the knight here is far better than positioning it on f3. Should the bishop play here in this case now, white can always say, no, I'm not allowing your bishop to take out my knight. I need him around to secure this weak spot in my position, this hole in my position on d4. Okay, let's dive into another example. Identifying some holes along the way. So far, so good. No holes for either side. What about after c4? Any holes? No, there are not. c6, any holes? Nope. Knight f3, knight f6, takes, takes. Even with a pawn capture, we have to consider have any holes been created as a result of that capture. In this case, no, still no holes for either side. Bishop out, e6, okay. We can already identify a hole for black, the d6 square. This is its quite unlikely that white will be able to take advantage of this. If, if somehow you can manage to get a pawn up here and then there's support for when or if one of your pieces get to that square, it's, it's a different story then, but that's pretty far-fetched. This isn't a, a hole that you could really take advantage of. Um, so it's, of course, clearing the way for the bishop to come out along the diagonal. E3, okay, we have a hole in the white position and black position. A6, another hole has been created. B6, black is looking to expand and maybe Fianchetto the bishop on the queen side. Bishop D3, B5, okay, there are certainly things we need to consider now. Any holes created with that last move, B5, yes. Consider now these four squares. Any of them weakened? Yes. How many of them? All of them. Four holes have been created with that last move. It's a lot. Of those four squares, this one right here is really the main one you should be focused on. Why exactly? Well, you already have pawn support for it. So all you're really needing to do for white is, well, you already have the first step. You know, you have... Your opponent has a gap in their position, a hole in their position. Can you position one of your pawns in a way where it controls that hole? White already has that. Can we somehow maneuver a piece here? We're going to see about that. How does the game proceed? White castles, bishop b7, knight here. Notice he's not going to c3. He wants to play to b3 and then go in here, and he will be a very disruptive piece when he is positioned in black's position on the c5 square. Next move, we have bishop d6, and this is an important point already. Um, recognizing this weak square c5, of course there are these, all of these squares are holes in black's position, but this is really the one that stands out, the one where we have already control of it. Uh, we have control of that c5 square with one of our pawns. The c5 square, should black be welcome to a dark square bishop exchange? In the game, the bishop played to d6, but might it have been better for the bishop to play to e7? These are things to consider, because 
you know, he has a few options. B4, probably not a good idea. I mean, he could be kicked from that square. But it's really coming down to, you know, when it's Black's turn to move, hmm, where do I go with my bishop? D, uh, E7, D6, uh, which one's better? And uh, for what reasons is uh, E7 better than D6 or vice versa? Well, let's look at the weaknesses. Let's look at the weakness in Black's position, C5. It, probably a good idea to hang on to this guy. Um, when considering these two, maybe best to stay, go to e7, avoid this dark square bishop exchange. That way, should a piece arrive on c5, at least you have the option of doing what? Taking it right out if it becomes bothersome to you. Okay, so this is just another instance of recognizing a weakness and how how does that help us make better decisions? This is a very basic decision, you know, where should I where should I deploy my bishop, e7 or d6? or more more of a, a question of, am I welcome to a dark square bishop exchange? Maybe not so much in this case, due to the weakness on the c5 square. Okay, well, as it went in this game, the dark square bishops were exchanged. White posts up in the center. The knight is exchanged. The queen recaptures. And maybe in hindsight, black would have done better to recapture with the knight, as awkward as that looks. Why exactly? Well, it's anticipating something that white is maybe looking to do. I know it's a backward move. Well, in fact, both moves are backward moves. But maybe there's a reason. Maybe, you, you know, from this information, if this is news to you, maybe this uh, brings to your attention different ideas. Seeing how white can be posting up to c5, maybe it's better to actually recapture with the knight. So you're watching over c5. In the game, it was queen takes, knight b3, castle, knight c5, the queen is hit, the rook occupies an open file, knight e4, bishop takes knight, pawn takes bishop, and this is as far as I want to go. This is a way that white can, uh, what we just observed here, is a way that white took advantage of a weakness within a black position. As it stands right now, it's a, still a tight game, it's a, it's a rough game, but white is... White is the preferred side due to the strongly placed knight on c5, a knight that cannot be kicked away um, by any of the black pieces. It's a, it's he's in a hole. Some some players may refer to this square as an outpost square. A hole is an outpost square, an, an excellent square for a knight primarily. But do know we're not limited in these examples. I'm showing you. Uh, I'm positioning a knight in a hole in the in the enemy position, but a rook can very well stand uh, good on a, a hole as well, especially in this position where you really can't scare away a rook. Um, so my main point, a hole was created on c5, and this was an example of how white can take advantage of this, how you can acquire a position where we have a knight that is really strongly placed now on the queen side and he cannot be chased away. He's he's really dictating play on the queen side and and placing uh certain restrictions on black. Black has to be very careful where they position their pieces to not end up in a fork or something of that nature. Okay. Let's have a look at another example. I just have a, a few more examples and we're gonna close with a, a very famous very famous game. Very instructive game. All right, identifying the holes. So far, no holes for either side. Let me just double check. Yep, no holes. C4, still nothing. Right there, bishop out. D5, let's consider. Boom, boom. One, two, three, four. These squares are not holes, but actually these two are. And of these two, the one that's really capturing your attention or should capture your attention is the one where we already have pawn support for. The e5 square is now a hole in the black position. How can white maybe take advantage of this? Let's see. Let's get some more moves in. e3. Preparing to get the bishop out. Bishop d6. And now we have the offer of a dark square bishop exchange. Bishop takes bishop, and this is an interesting moment in the game. 
Two ways to recapture. How would you recapture? In the game, the queen captured, but knowing the gap you have in your position is black on e5, maybe you'll give some consideration next time to taking with the pawn. Because what does this do? It it remedies the hole in your position. You're not always going to have this opportunity. It will, you know, after the d5 move has been played, I, from the definition I said, a hole is a square that can no longer be controlled by any black pawns. Well, there are rare exception, you know, rare cases where it actually can be repaired, but it will require the help, of course, uh, by white, you know, bishop to d6, excuse me, e3, bishop d6. White doesn't have to capture here and allow the pawn to recapture, and uh, black would then have control of e5. So with, you know, these 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 are some rare cases, but if the, if the bishop is capturing like this, well, that hole can actually be repaired in this case. Um, in the game, we had bishop takes, queen recaptured, so this still remains a hole. Knight e5, knight d7, the knights are exchanged. Where's he going, do you think? c3 or d2? He's actually headed for the weakness in black's position, d2. Bishop d3, c6. Let's see with this last move, any holes? Actually, yes. The d6 square is now a hole. Not one that already has pawn support. It's it's kind of tough to imagine a, a white piece being able to uh, position itself on d6, but certainly e5 is is not long off. White castles, knight e4. We can take that knight, but white, white doesn't take the knight. He plays knight f3. If you take the knight right now, notice after it captures, how are we getting to this square? Can't do it. We, we, can't, we can't make use of that e5 square. So first we play knight f3 as white, h6, rook c1, the king goes to the corner, c5. These are, of course, not best moves for both sides by any means. c5, the queen goes back, we take the knight, and then play knight to e5. This is another case, some... Uh, some may identify this as like a really good knight versus a not so good bishop. Th these are the type of situations that can come about in a chess game. We do have this very case right now. A knight on e5, really strong knight, in a hole in black's position. He cannot be kicked away. He has support by a pawn. Who's going to chase him away? Nobody. Um, in uh, one of the earlier videos from this playlist... I showed, uh, on, the, on the board, I showed the number of squares each piece, uh, the number of possibilities each piece has from every square uh, on, on, on the board. Uh, the knight uh, was an interesting piece to observe. Uh, the knight on any one of these 16 squares has a maximum number of possibilities. Um, eight possibilities from any of these squares, um, any of these 16 squares. Um, you may want to consider, it's just a, it's just an idea, but uh, just kind of viewing it from a bit of a mathy point of view, uh, the relative value of the pieces, they they tend to increase the further up the board uh, they get. So, I mean, this knight on e5, you may, you know, if I were to just hold the knight in my hand and say, how much is the knight worth? You'd say three. And we know this from a previous video. That's the knight's, uh, the, the value it's given. Um, but a knight in this position, I, I find it very hard to, you know, I, w I would not be so quick to buy into the knight as being only worth three in this position. He's a knight that's in black's position. He cannot be dislodged. He's threatening many things. He's placing a certain restriction on the black queen. She can't go too far. She has to watch over the bishop. The knight's already threatening a fork here to win material. The knight being worth three from this position? No way. Sometimes when you're able to pos position a piece like this, 
your opponent already starts to begin uh, thinking about, you know what, I'm going to give up some material. I'm just going to get rid of this guy. Yeah, I know I'm going to be down a point material-wise, but at least I don't have to worry. I don't have to work around this strongly placed knight on e5. Um, maybe you would want to view it as when the knight is on this back rank, it's kind of like worth, I don't know, zero points. If it somehow gets to the second rank, maybe it's worth one. Third rank, two. Fourth rank, three. Fifth rank, maybe it starts to be worth, I don't know, four? Four and a half? Who knows? Maybe five? Maybe he's more valuable than like a rook? It might not be a bad way to view things. Just giving you a rough idea. I mean, you play around with it however you want. You come up with some system for yourself, something that is going to help benefit your play. Um, some, I don't know the exact quote, but some, uh, I believe it said that a, a knight on the sixth rank, and you could you could go to sleep, like if, you, if you're somehow able to position a knight on one of these squares, where he has eight options, one of these squares, he's just a, wow, good luck black if a knight is somehow able to position himself in a way where he can't be dislodged and he's on these sixth rank squares, he's going to be a monster and a half, okay? Just giving you a little bit of an idea how you might want to view the position of certain pieces as they move up the board here. Um, he's in this weak square. We know this now. We know that e5 is a hole. The knight is entrenched there right now. Can't be kicked away. Really strong piece. He's probably far more valuable than just three points. Okay, let's see how things played out from here. Rook f6 was played in this game, but you know, some this is this is an interesting moment. Uh, Black could do many different things here. Uh, Black could play this move right here, right, and attack this pawn, and that would be a bad move, of course, wouldn't it? Because it drops the bishop. And you might see that this happens in a chess game. Now, just thinking hypothetically, suppose this happened in a game. Suppose you're playing as black, and this is the position of the knight on e5. And this is the move that you did. Okay, for many of you, you're, you're thinking to yourself, you know, okay, I'm not going to draw my bishop. You know, I'm not going to go after this pawn. I recognize I have to watch over the bishop. Fine. I believe you. Uh, I believe that you're not going to fall for that. Uh, you could work around it. You're, you're, you're going to do something different. You're going to, let's say, um, I don't know, move this bishop right here and defend against the, the fork. Great. You just uh, sidestepped a, a little trick that white had. Fine. You're working around the knight. So far, so good. Let's move forward a little bit. F3. Pawn takes. Rook takes. This rook isn't doing anything. You get your rooks doubled, right? That's something you might do. You're just doubling the rooks. Uh, forming a battery, having two or more pieces trained along a, a file, rank, or diagonal. Black is now forming a battery like this. Um, unfortunately, that falls for a tactic, as natural as looking as it is. I know I showed queen a5, that was like a blatant blunder. But this, as natural as it looks, is actually still a blunder, because that pesky knight, that strongly placed knight, sure enough, did what? Played into g6 anyway. If rook takes knight, well, there goes your rook. White is going to be winning. What's my point with this? Well, one other thing I wanted to highlight <laughs> on this topic of holes in a chess game is that, you know, if I were to ask the black player in this position, you know, suppose the game did, did fall like this, where the knight went here, takes, takes, and white eventually simplified in one as a result of having this material plus. Now, if I ask the black player, uh, you know, wh wh why'd you lose that game? If black comes back to me and says, yeah, I fell for a little tactic. I fell for, uh, you know, uh, a knight fork and I lost some material. Is that really a good reason? No. What they should be saying is, I allowed my opponent's knight, I created, I created an environment uh, where my opponent was able to take advantage of a weakness in that position. I have far more respect for that answer than, yeah, I just fell for a blunder. 
No, you allowed an excellent position for your opponent's piece, and they took advantage of the weaknesses that you created in your position. That's a far better answer than diagnosing it as, ah, I just blundered my rook, I fell for a, a, a little tactic. That's going to happen. Uh, these positional features are really putting white in a position to have these tactics be very likely. And we're just seeing a very quick example of this in action. Knight g6 hits, and that's an absolute killer. Okay. Let's have a look at another example, one where we can potentially see a knight end up on the sixth rank. So far with these pawn moves, no weaknesses. Okay, one weakness. White looks to Fienchetto. Another weakness for black. Castle, ship out. D4, any weaknesses? No, nope, not yet. Takes, takes. Castle, H3. This square is weakened, but no, no holes have been created with that last move. A6, okay, one weakness. B6 is now a hole. H6 and B6. H3 for white. These are the only holes in the, white, in the, in the position. Bishop e3, knight here, white steps up to defend here. c3 is now a hole with this last move. c3 is a hole, and also a3. Okay, h6, knight d5, knight takes, pawn takes, and what does black do next? What's one move you really don't want to play as black? Well, black plays b5, doing what? Preparing to Fienchetto. Hmm, hang on weakening four squares and this one right here is the main one that you should really be focused on white already has a pawn there supporting that square so who's going to be around to watch over that square it's got to be the minor pieces the knight the bishop the light square bishop's the only one that could do that and what if he's not here anymore well sure enough he's kicked f4 you cannot rely upon see this is one of the downsides sure you could devote a knight or a bishop, but they have the potential to be kicked away. When you place that type of restriction on your pieces, they are vulnerable, in some sense, to the tactic of deflection. Right now, this is what white's doing. They're deflecting the knight away from defensive c6, so that when the knight moves, what happens? Boom. Knight on d6. He's an animal. He's a beast. He's really, really strong. And what is he doing? He's hitting the queen, he's hitting the pawn, and making the queen move look ridiculous. Look at that job. It's not a job you want as a black queen. Defending a pawn not fun. She's not free. Is she really worth nine? No way. This is a really strong knight. The move b5 should never have been played. Why? It creates a tremendous gap on d6. It allows a fantastic position eventually for a white knight. A knight on the fifth rank we already saw can be uh, really good. Sixth rank, just that much better. So, Something that would have been better for black is to actually play this move, not in this position, to eventually play this move. It's a little bit uncomfortable, and what I'm going over right now is a little bit beyond the scope of this topic, but what black should have done is play the knight move here and then look to position like this, and only then play the bishop to d7. The problem with bishop d7 is that, well, actually he's short on squares. After f4, there's no safe square for him to go to. Knight here first, then knight here, and only then, I don't know, after, let's say, something like this, the bishop can play to c8. And by this reorganization of the black pieces, at the very least, they are not creating an exploitable uh, gap in their position. They're not creating a hole in their position. They're not creating a hole on c6 that white already has support for. Okay. Let's dive into another example, just two more, and then a really nice game to finish up. So, here we go. And this, to the more experienced player, this variation that I'm going through right now may look very familiar to you. So far, we only have one hole, a hole for black on h6. e4. And actually, with this last move, let's consider... Boom, boom, these four squares, any of them holes? Yes. 
F3 is defended. F4 can be defended. So not those squares, but actually these two highlighted squares are now holes in the white position. Um, yeah, D3, D4, and D3 are now holes. Um, so what black can look to eventually do is first control this square right here, D4 with the pun. Let's see how that comes up. First, D6. It's preparing maybe this move or this move. Striking at the weak point, striking at the hole in white's position, D4. Castles, bishop E2, E5 hits. Striking at the white center. In a previous video, I discussed, you know, what to do in a chess opening. I referred to uh, uh, some things I pointed out. I said to create and or uh, challenge a pawn duo. Um, you'll notice that in this example, we have a case where black is allowing not only a pawn duo, but like a, a trio, and only a little bit later is striking at it. This is known as a, uh, um, a hyper-modern approach, an approach where, you know what you say, Go ahead, you could build up a strong center, but in time, uh, I will be strike in in short time, I will be striking at it and trying to take advantage of the time that you invested building up. Uh, the, the, try and take advantage of all the tempi you spent in building up your center. Castle, bishop e2, e5, any weakness with that move? Yes, f3 is now an additional hole h6 was a hole and now we have f6 okay castles knight here pawn advances knight up knight back don't uh, be too focused on uh, these knight moves just yet we have knight here pawn there and now what to do in this position for white uh, if you'd like to go ahead and pause the video what move would you play in this position as white. Knowing the things that we've been uh, discussing about uh, weaknesses, uh, holes in the position, and what something you really don't want to allow, uh, you know, something you don't want to have happen to you. You don't want to have your opponent be able to position one of their pieces uh, in a hole in your position. It's something you really should uh, take good care of. What would you do in this position as white? If you'd like to, again, pause the video, see what you can come up with. Okay. Uh, the best move in this position is f3, but why? Why is that the best move? Why is, let's say, pawn takes pawn not the best move? Um, one more pop quiz. Should white capture on f5 with the pawn, how would you recapture? If you'd like to, go ahead, pause the video, see what you'd come up with. Okay, let's discuss this first. Let's assume that white does not play the best move f3. We'll see why this is soon enough, why f3 is the best move. But let's see what the best way would be for black to recapture. Many different ways. Bishop, knight, pawn, rook. Wow. Okay, this certainly has its points. Capturing with the pawn, forming a pawn duo, controlling many squares, watching over e4 so that the knight cannot make use of that. But... One of the better ones is to still keep this file half opened. Taking like this, it's no longer half opened. Taking with the knight, not developing a new piece, taking with the knight so that he can do what? Next, post up in the hole in white's position on d4, a square that already has pawn support and even, one would say, indirect support of the bishop, of the fiend kettled bishop. This is going to happen. As white, if you take like this, this is basically what you are saying. You are saying, I'm okay. I will apparently be okay with working around one day a knight in my position on d4. He's going to hurt you. He is definitely going to hurt you. Somehow or another, it's going to happen. Um, that said, as white, what should you do? You should keep this knight out. Once he gets to f5, you can't stop him from getting to d4. So the idea here is to stop him from getting to f5. And the only way to really do that is to make sure you maintain a pawn on e4. Make sure you're able to, let's say, box the knight out. f3 
is the best move here so that in the event of pawn takes you retake with the pawn and you restrict the knight from even stepping foot on f5 he can't even he can't even think about getting to d4 for as long as the pawn is on the e4 square okay so notice how our understanding here of the weaknesses uh, the weakness on d4 we identified that very early on in this game we're at move 11 right now but we identified it within just the first four moves we identified the weakness. We know that we would really not want to work around a black knight in this position. How can this help influence our decision making later on? Well, when f5 strikes, we certainly want to be in a position to make sure we can recapture with the pawn. Not allow this guy to pivot here, because once he's on f5, he is getting to the hole in the white position on d4. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out. Um, uh, some some players out there may be, I don't know, um, let's say, in armored with certain visual things in a chess game. I'm, I'm not sure, well, I, I, I don't have reasons why this is the case. Certain, there might be certain uh, setups one does because it's aesthetic to the player, but this does not translate, this does not in, in any way imply that it's good chess play. Um, what I'm talking about is uh, if you do something like uh, this as white. If you m move three pawns out and then you go four pawns out, this is actually an opening, but there's know that when you're doing these moves, you are investing time, investing tempi. You're, you're, not, you're not making developing moves. You don't need to move these four pawns out to get just two bishops out. You're investing some tempi, and you are creating many weaknesses. If you are moving these four pawns, you could have a, a closer look at it. I'll just identify it right away. These four squares are now holes in white's position. So not only by doing these, you know quite possibly aesthetically pleasing setups where, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to push four pawns in the center, or maybe even five or six, because I really like how that looks. Well, yeah, you, not only are you wasting time, but you're creating gaps, you're creating weaknesses in your position. So these are things to really shy away from. Um, if for some reason, you know, that describes you, maybe if you're, if you're really trying to prove as a chess player, steer clear of these things that may be aesthetically pleasing to you because know that there are deficiencies here. There are weaknesses in the white position as a result of these four pawn advances or I don't know, maybe you're doing five or six or being crazy, stuff like that, you know? Recognize the time that's wasted, the tempi you are wasting with that, and also the we the weaknesses you are creating with such a setup. Okay, one more example and then a game, a... Uh, very famous, a very instructive game. So here we go. All right. So this example, where are the holes? Let's see. So far, no holes for either side. Chop, chop, and c5. Okay. This is something that is very popular. I can't tell you how many times I have had an opponent do this to me like this exact this these exact moves like I'm playing as white I play e4 they play e5 we get a knight out yes we're both I attack they defend great d4 chop chop they chop again I recapture and then they play c5 after just these five moves let me mention that black has already committed two serious errors um a Let's back up here. Their first error was capturing on d4. What is that doing? It's wasting time. That's not a developing move. In fact, that's helping me develop my queen. I'm recapturing, and my queen is really strong in this square. This is not a case of, oh, you brought your queen out too early, and I'm going to attack her like crazy. No. Sure, on this next move, black is moving forward, but that's not a developing move. In fact, that's a weakening move. And let me go one step further. This, a move like c5 tells an experienced player a great deal about 
the black's black's strength their playing strength it the move c5 let me back up the move knight takes knight is a time error okay that that capture on d4 accentuates white's development it makes it makes it more prominent uh the move c5 tremendous weakness weaknesses have been created with that move let's consider after this advance these four squares any of them holes not this square not this square but the other two you bet d6 and d5 are now holes it's just how it is they can no longer be defended by any black pawns and black will be punished because of this um this is a very amateurish thing to do the move c5 uh the amateur player the beginner like player does a move like this because they think aha i'm attacking the queen and if they don't see it i'm going to get the queen but what's really going on here is you know what the queen the, these weaknesses right here will be pounced on by white they're going to take great advantage of it and the weakness that you just created here as early as move 5 you know team black the weakness that you just created here um will uh have you on your heels for the rest of the game and you are bound to lose material in short order it's just how it's going to go this is these are irreparable weaknesses these gaps you've you've created on d5 and d4 uh, how the game can follow is queen check the queens are exchanged and we direct our pieces where they can one day position on d5 it's an excellent post for a piece d6 guess where he's going he's pointing at not only a weak square but guess who's on a weak square this pawn we could identify this as a backward pawn he struck at once and guess what here's a nice move queenside castle king is safe rook is hitting here he sits twice how do you defend it you can't you're already going to drop material we're just 10 moves in and you're already busted this is a losing position for black i know it's just a pawn but we know uh <laughs> you're down material we we have these little tricks up our sleeve these little effective strategies we're going to trade down so that we're getting king ver king versus king where well king and pawn versus king we know how to push through and promote main point here black created weaknesses very early on they could be punished very swiftly uh as a result of not only capturing the knight like this in advancing white's development but this c5 move look at the weaknesses it creates you need to take that into account the gaps you uh leave behind with your pawn advances this is not a good move very uh amateurish move the c5 advance from this position uh as a close to this video which is quite lengthy already i'm <laughs> looking at it at the corner of my eye i'm looking at the recording um as a close let's have a look at a game very instructive game between playing on the white end isaac bolslavsky and uh georgie lisitsin okay have the game kicking off with e4 c5 no holes so far no holes i'll point them out looking at the pawn moves aha okay h6 is weakened h6 is a hole bishop e3 f3 okay we have another hole e3 is a hole it has it has its points it's stopping it's securing the bishop on the e3 square so that the knight doesn't kick it away castles queen up getting some developing moves in knight takes bishop takes queen out king over e5 okay so some holes are created with this how many exactly well let's consider of these four how many are holes not this one let's get rid of that but the other three are now actually all holes these three highlighted can no longer be controlled by any black pawns so um of these of these three which one should really be standing out well the one that you already have pawn support for so really the d5 square is a big one to focus in on so the bishop retreats it's out of the way bishop e6 a2 is has some pressure so a3 
or up there. And now we have the start of a maneuver that gives up some material. We'll soon, we'll soon see this. Uh, White's idea here with this game is to invest some material. In fact, with this next move, we'll see. Uh, the idea is to give up some material uh, in exchange for establishing a really strong knight in the black position on the d5 square. It starts out with the move c4. This pawn is hit twice, and it's only defended once, so black can win material, and does. He goes for it. Bishop takes pawn. Knight c3 first, attacking the queen. Only after she moves is the bishop captured. And now, if the knight plays here, the knight gets rid of it. But, first, bishop g5. So, white had already identified the weakness as soon as e5 was played. And he already started to think about a way to take advantage of that weak square on d5. Well, the knight is now pinned to the rook. He's t taken out. And what do we have with knight d5? A really strong piece, a case of a really strong knight and a really, really sad bishop. He cannot be kicked away from the d5 square. It's a hole. He has support, and he is having a tremendous influence in the position. Attacking the queen currently. Queen h4, queen e2, queen f1. Just describing it very quickly, the idea is to actually do a little bit of a pawn storm where you're throwing your your pawns at your opponent's king and trying to create pawn exchanges so that the rooks can attack. This is a good uh, idea when the kings are on opposite sides of the board to attack one another's king. Queen f1. You want to play g3 without the queen playing to h3. Uh, that would stop the h-pawn from advancing. So queen f1. Only now g3. The queen cannot play here to stop the pawn from advancing. She would just get captured. She moves away, h4 hits, here comes g4, here comes capture, the h-file is now half opened. White is in the driver's seat, look at this knight. He is at any moment ready to land here with check, and who knows, maybe he attacks something else along the way. Queen g6, g5. This rook is hanging, or is it? No, it was actually indirectly defended. Black would run into a fork if he captures the rook. h6. Rook takes? Well, the bishop can take, right? No, can't do that again. Why? Because of the strongly placed knight on d5, the knight that's in the hole in black's position, knight e7 would hit, and there goes your queen in yet another way. Really strong piece, well worth the material invested. White is down a pawn, but... Or, excuse me, not right now. He's not down a pawn, but the investment to establish a position in this weak square on d5 is well worth it. White gave up a pawn in order to establish this strong piece, uh, to establish this knight in the hole in black's position, and he's really incredible. To say that he's only worth three, he is worth so much more. So, queen takes pawn, rook here, and it, at this point black already resigned. There's not much to do. The g-file is completely open, the h-file is completely open, White King's perfectly safe, strong knight, silly bishop, dumb rook. Where's the queen go? If she goes here, queen h1, and guess what's happening next? At the very least, rook g1, and you could you could already see what's going to happen to the queen. She's dead, and there's no way to save it. You go here to interfere with the pin against this. Well, don't forget about knight e7. And if the queen runs away, well, that's check, and that's checkmate. Everything is centered around this really strongly placed piece in a hole in black's position. There was a lot of stuff covered in this video. Um, it's going on for some time now. If you're still with me, hats off to you. You have a lot of patience, and I hope you got a real lot out of this video. Um, watch it again if you have to. There's a lot of stuff covered here. Um, going into this one, I did not know how deep I wanted to take certain things. Um, there was a lot more to learn in this one beyond just identifying, again, these weaknesses, these, these holes in the position. They, there's so much more that you can derive from just this little piece of information regarding holes in a chess game. And I really do hope that you got a lot 
uh, from this one and we'll continue to build on this as we go deeper and deeper into this playlist of course so um, I'd like to close with how I normally do um, I hope you got something out of this and we will see what is in store for video 14 so that's all for now take care bye